This is Matteo Condalucci, a former nightclub bouncer. But back in 1994, that wasn't the only thing he was famous for. He was convicted of child molestation in Florida. After serving five years in prison, he was back on the streets, and in 2007, another case emerged, this time from Sarpy County, Nebraska. He had raped a 13-year-old girl and only served two years in prison. Prosecutors feared him, labeling him as a, quote, dangerous sex offender, even after his release from prison in 2009. During his time, Condalucci turned to religion and became a pastor. He preached about forgiveness, but his past continued to haunt him. He moved to Omaha and started serving meals to the homeless, hoping to find redemption in their eyes. He gave haircuts and talked about the power of love. For a time, it seemed as though he had turned his life around. Now, of course, we can't zoom past the fact that he did just five years for rape in 1994 and two years in 2007. Just before his 1994 arrest, he made an enemy who would later go to the ends of the world to have him destroyed. This was Laura Smith, who had just moved in with him, unaware of the danger she was bringing into her home. In May of 1993, one night she had gone out for a late grocery run, leaving her son in the care of Condalucci. What she did not know was that this former nightclub bouncer had a twisted fascination with young children. When she returned home, she found her son crying violently in the bathroom. Condalucci tried to brush it off, claiming the child had just wet the bed. But Laura knew something was wrong. Her son had never wet the bed before. As they left the house the next day, her son quietly told her, quote, Mommy, I got something I gotta tell you." And in that instant, Laura knew that her worst fears had come true. Condalucci was sentenced to four years of probation and drug counseling after he pleaded no contest in 1994 to attempted lewd and lascivious assault upon a child. But Laura's satisfaction was short-lived. Condalucci continued his sinister ways, manipulating and preying on vulnerable children. In 2007, he was convicted of raping a 13-year-old girl and was sentenced to five years in prison. But even behind bars, his dark influence lingered. He was released in half that time for good behavior, and the world was once again exposed to his dangerous presence. The real reason Laura kept her grudge was that she watched in horror as her son struggled to cope with the trauma he had endured. To her son, the drugs were a temporary escape from the pain, but that only made things worse. He died later due to a drug overdose, and she continued to blame him and also turned to Facebook, hoping to warn other mothers of the danger that lurked in the shadows. In over a dozen posts on a Facebook page naming her son's abuser, Laura wrote about the manipulative tricks that Condalucci used on single mothers to get his hands on their children. She knew that the only way to stop him was to expose him for the monster that he was. Now, even with his sick past, Condalucci had a family. A daughter named Amanda and a son named Joseph. Even though he was taken away for just seven years of her life, the rest of the years, he spent torturing and sexually abusing his own daughter, Amanda. And on his death, she was the second person to celebrate instead of mourn. I've had to live in fear for 34 years. And it has been the worst pain that I could imagine. And so when I finally got the phone call, yes, I, I was relieved. I couldn't wait to have him cremated. I couldn't. And I know that sounds horrible, but he took my life and many other lives before he died. We might still be living, but when you molest and rape children and your own child, you automatically took their lives. A tearful relief for Amanda as she cries not about her father's death, but about the experience she and many other kids went through. Justice wasn't exactly served here, but to her, this is still a win. I'm not at all saying I agree with murder. But when you've been violated so many times and the justice system has failed you as many times as it's failed me, 
That's the only thing you could hope for. In the news report, she shared the horrid details of the house and how she was the first-hand witness to his crimes. Crimes which she could not take to the police, fearing that it would just be a few years in prison and then death for her. After he was gone, she went back to sweep the house and realized that this man had not changed even after seven years of doing time. The interviewer asked her whether more kids would have been victims had he not died. Amanda's answer was chilling, to say the least. I found children's clothing in his house. When I was packing his house, and I found little boy's pants, khaki pants. They weren't new. They had stains on the knees like they had been playing in the yard or something. I found little girl's blouses. I found a pair of little girl's panties. Panties. No. I don't think he was going to stop. No, I know he wasn't going to stop. You get the picture. This man was tormenting little kids with his playground and was self-loathing in his pedophilic behavior day after day. Amanda later made it clear that it's registries like sex offender registries that can't be ignored. I can't say it with any more passion than do your research. That's what the registry is for. Know who you are allowing your children around. If your children has been with somebody for the day and they're acting strange, um, they're not themselves, talk to them. Meanwhile, on the other side, his son Joseph claimed that his father was a changed man. I believe he was doing his what, what he could to turn his life around, yeah. I mean, who, who, who's to say, you know, I mean, who's to say, you know, exactly what it takes to, you know, turn your life around from, from something like that. But obviously, as a man, he can't quite understand what his sister went through. She saw and experienced the pain herself. She prayed for him to either go away for life or get a death sentence. And when the authorities failed to deliver on this, in came James Fairbanks. On May 14th, 2020, James Fairbanks killed Matteo Condolucci. There was no investigation needed here because he commented his entire confession under the post published in the Omaha Scanner Facebook group. He wrote that he was out apartment searching and checking the neighborhoods when he, quote, stumbled across his sex offender registry info. He read about Condolucci, especially the part where he had, quote, been convicted twice, yet only served two years in prison. Now, of course, he didn't act on this, but he did write in his confessions that, quote, he was standing in the driveway pretending to wash his truck, no soap or water, just a rag, while staring at a group of children playing in the street. He just kept staring at them. The kids thankfully left and he went inside. It's as if his lust had not ended and the two years he spent taught him nothing. He found more dirt about him online, even the Predator Facebook page about him, which was made by the woman Laura Smith. He also confessed that he, quote, worked with kids for years who have been victimized and couldn't in good conscience allow him to do it to anyone else while he had the means to stop him. He concluded by saying, quote, I know in this messed up judicial system that means I will face far more severe punishment for stopping him than he did for raping kids, but I could no longer do nothing. What you're about to see is a teacher turned killer who just couldn't stand living next to a sex offender. Um, well, in the original email I sent, I kind of started it uh, to explain, basically, uh, like I said, I was out kind of searching for an apartment. Um, I work in the area, my goddaughters live in the area, and they spend a lot of time with me, and my son was looking uh, to move in with me, possibly. And, I have two jobs. One of them was for OPS. Another one was working uh, overnights, a few nights a week, in the halfway house uh, that I was working at. So I had wanted to uh, make sure because there were going to be certain nights, you know, my teenage uh, son and goddaughters would be left alone. I just thought, you know, I better check to make sure right here in this big direct area there isn't a, a convicted sex offender, you know, so to speak, living right next door or something because I would be home every night. To, and it turned out there was. Moving into his new apartment, he found Condolucci, a registered sex offender, living free. 
He double-checked the information on whether this information was old, and even though it was, his actions were still the same. He also noticed that he had a kid's playground in his backyard, a disturbing excuse to lure kids. But it wasn't enough, so he had to dig into more details about this guy to make sure if he was a potential threat or not. I've had personal experience. Uh, when I was a kid, I personally wasn't uh, molested, but a loved one was, and I don't want to get into that too much because they have chosen not to speak about it, so I don't want to uh, speak for them. But I witnessed it, and um, the situation happened. And then again, like I said, when working, I've watched the kids um, over the years that I've worked with. Just so many have combined in me that the, the torment, the pain that they're going through with their abuse that they've suffered. And I've watched them grow up and become drug addicts and just have no self-worth. And, and I've seen, you know, the lifelong um, suffering that so many of these kids endure at that age because I have such first-hand knowledge. I mean, I think I was just... Like it was bothering me. Um. As a former victim and someone who worked with kids, he could not stand it. Before he could do the worst, he had to give a message in the strictest way possible. But when that didn't work, he took matters into his own hands. I didn't feel like there was, like I said, anybody I could turn to with all this, so I decided I was going to go over there and uh, threaten him, basically was my intention to go over there and let them know, look, I know who you are. I watched you the other day. If you touch any of these kids, you're not going to get another slap on the wrist from the, from the uh, justice system. I'm coming next time. Next time you touch one of these kids, you're going to deal with me. I brought a gun, uh, as I said, or obviously. Um, I, I, I went, approached his house. He opened the door. He saw me coming. Um, I pulled the gun out, I uh, told him to back up, and I went to have the conversation, or basically just to tell him exactly what I just said, look, you touch those kids, there's going to be some punishment that's going to come, and it's not going to be another probation or, or slap on the wrist or anything like that. Uh, as soon as I started talking, he came forward, um, and immediately again, he was a six foot, 300 plus pound man, I knew I had to shoot, or uh, who knows what was going to happen again. I mean, I'm willing to take responsibility for the fact that I went over to his house with a gun to threaten him, and what happened and what transpired, transpired. Uh, my intention was not to walk over there and just shoot him, period. Um, that's what it ended up happening. Um, One bullet pierced his forehead, and the other bullets hit his back and chest. Overall, he was shot seven times. Fairbanks pled no contest to second-degree murder, and on July 14, 2021, he was sentenced to 40 to 70 years in prison, all for taking matters into his own hands. In the aftermath, people took sides. Remember Laura Smith? She thought that Fairbanks shouldn't get jail time at all. Remember Condolucci's daughter, Amanda Henry? She argued that Fairbanks should only get probation. She knew the horrors that her father was capable of, but she couldn't condone murder, which makes sense. Fairbanks' ex-wife, Kelly Tameo, who had sought protection orders against him in the past, also voiced her support. She knew that her ex-husband had a good heart and was willing to do what was necessary to protect the kids, something that he was grateful for despite being behind bars. I want to point out uh, a couple of things also. And that is, um, I've been deeply, uh, I've been deeply grateful and appreciate all the support that I've received from, from the Free James Fairbanks campaigns and the petitions and all of those things online. Um, I am asking, though, that those people channel their efforts elsewhere to changing these laws, to actually doing something other than freeing me. Um, I can handle whatever I have coming my way, and if the whole point of all of this is I just get off, then I think we missed a chance to actually do something, and that's, that's take this momentum that seems to be out there and freeing me and, and channeling it to the district attorney and the judges and the legislators and go, we need st uh, tougher penalties, we need to stop cutting these deals that allow men like him to, to molest children for decades. And, 
and only serve minimum sentences and be allowed to move right back into our neighborhoods um, alone and put up playgrounds in their backyards and just look for their next victims. Um, you know, I wish the DA would go after them the way they're going after me, to be perfectly honest. You know, I get no bail. I'm first degree. There's, I'm in jail with a whole bunch of guys in here that are getting prosecuted for, for not raping children. And they're getting prosecuted harder than a lot of the times we see child molesters. And why that is in the justice system, I don't know. It's got to stop, though, and it's got to change. Quite honestly, I don't think me and Mr. Conalucci should have ever come in contact. Um, you should have been there. It, you, you, you're a repeat sex offender. You just shouldn't be alone living amongst kids in a neighborhood. In his expression of gratitude, he didn't want the world to lose sight of the lesson. The lesson of not allowing sex offenders a small-time conviction and giving them life or death in prison. His story resembles to some extent with the infamous Stephen Marshall. And if you don't know who he is, he killed 29 out of 34 sex offenders listed on the main registry. He used to think the pedophiles were, quote, scums of the earth, and took matters into his own hand before taking his own life. But that's a story for another day. A petition on Change.org has garnered immense support, with over 58,000 signatures calling for the pardon of James Fairbanks. However, Fairbanks himself has expressed a willingness to accept a plea bargain for the crimes he believes he's accountable for. In exchange, he's urging the county attorney and state legislatures to reform the way convicted sex offenders are punished and tracked. Despite his offer, Fairbanks is also willing to face trial, as he has doubts about whether a jury would unanimously convict him of first-degree murder if they had access to all the facts. This development has created an intriguing and complex situation that highlights the need for both judicial reform and individual accountability. The victim's son acknowledged his father's criminal history, but he didn't believe that Fairbanks had the right to take the law into his own hands. This compelled the interrogator to ask whether his actions could inspire the world to have more James Fairbanks and Stephen Marshalls out there, but his response was simple and smooth. Sex offender, convicted sex offender, who says that now they're they're afraid because their you know, names and addresses are posted online for anybody to come come do that. Well, what do you what would you say to you know others who you know are seeing sex offenders living in their area and uh, you know upset about that? Well, as far as the sex offenders that are upset, um, or maybe they feel feel in fear or. Uh, scared, uh, vulnerable because of um, what I did, you know. Congratulations, now you know what your victims feel like. 